Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we are gathered together this morning to worship you and to praise your name, we ask that you would open our ears, that we would hear your voice, open our hearts that we might receive from you today, and take our hands and our feet and use them to serve you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. It's a uh, great privilege to be here with you this morning and uh, to be able to share with, with you all. And um, for those of you who are wondering who um, the dashingly handsome young man is in front of you, um, well, he's your rector, but um, then, my, but uh, my name is Sean Branch and um, I have the privilege of uh, being the director of Threshold Ministries, formerly the uh, church army here in Canada. And uh, I know this parish and this congregation has had a long history of support. Uh, and so first, let me say thank you for that. Um, and uh, know that I, I speak uh, not only on my behalf when I say thank you, but on behalf of all of our evangelists and volunteers across the country. This morning's gospel is a challenging gospel. And in it causes a lot of confusion for not only the disciples, but I think uh, even 2,000 years later, we're still struggling to understand it. I have a personal question that I, want, that I want to invite you to reflect on for a moment. How many of you have ever been in a situation where you saw something or you were hearing something and you made a prediction about what the outcome might be? Most of us? at one time or another? How many of us are normally right with our predictions? Not so much. A couple of examples from our history. In 1943, the chairman of IBM said, I think there's a, a, there is a world market for maybe a total of five computers. In uh, 49, there was uh, Popular Mechanics, that magazine, made a prediction that said, on a calculator, the ENIC is equipped with 18,000 vacuum tubes and weighs 30 tons. Computers in the future may have only 1,000 vacuum tubes and weigh only one and a half tons. Surprisingly, my computer's gotten through um, Air Canada's luggage weight limit. Uh, there was an inventor by the name of Lee DeFrost, and he claimed that while theoretically and technically televisions may be feasible, commercially and financially, it's an impossibility. Anyone turn on a square box this morning? There was a recording company that uh, made this prediction about a certain band. They said, we like the sound, but uh, guitar music is on its way out. That was in 1962, uh, and that band that uh, they thought wouldn't last was the Beatles. Lots of predictions, and even some of the stuff that's happening in our world today, and even in this fair city, we make predictions about situations, and often we will probably look back a few years from now and say, man, we were way off. The disciples walked out of the temple in Jerusalem, and the disciples were sitting there with Jesus, and he, and he paused with them. They stopped and looked back, and like most of our churches, the temple was built to be seen from everywhere. I was driving here this morning and I was following my GPS, which I was sharing with Tay on my way in. I got a little panicked because it was taking me through the setup for the parade. And I thought, I don't know the city well enough if I get to a block and they say, you can't go any further. <laughs> but I, as I was coming down the road, I looked up and I could see the steeple 
or the tower for the Messiah from a few blocks away. When you live, when you go out into the country, you can see the steeples from quite a distance. The temple was built the same way. And they looked back, and Jesus and the disciples said, this isn't going to last. Jesus predicted to them that not one stone will be left on top of another. To the, to the disciples and the culture and the people, the temple was the cornerstone. It was the bedrock. Nothing could bring these walls down. The disciples turned to Jesus and thought, uh, you know, out of everything he has said, everything he has done, here's the one thing Jesus is wrong about. And they said, look, teacher, like these are massive, massive stones and magnificent buildings. Well, the smallest stone, just for those of you who like historical facts, the smallest stone of that structure weighed between two and three tons. Most of them weighed about 50 tons. The largest part was what we commonly call the Wailing Wall. It is about 12 meters in length, three meters high, and weighs hundreds of tons. The stones were so huge that neither mortar nor any other binding material is used in between them. The stability was attained by the great weight of the stones, just the sheer pressure and power of each stone held them together. The walls towered over the city, 400 feet in one area. Inside the four walls, there was 45 acres. And during Jesus' lifetime, 40, about a quarter of a million people could fit with inside. For those of you who are sports fans, um, there's not one sports structure today that matches that size. And so you can understand possibly the fact that the disciples were struggling with Jesus' prediction. And so they walked down the Kidron Valley up to the Mount of Olives, and Peter, James, and John, they wanted to hear some more. Jesus predicted that a structure so immense would be leveled to the ground, it just seemed impossible. So they pressed Jesus for more information. They wanted to know when. When was this going to happen? What would the signs be that this would take place? I remember as a child growing up, uh, when I went to the grocery store with my mother, the, uh, the checkout aisle would be littered with you know, these magazines that had all these predictions about the end of the world. And as a kid, I used to like pick them up and read them and think, it's saying there's gonna be massive rain. You know? And as a child, I looked out the window and it's raining. And I thought, oh my gosh, it's happening. And I thought, Mom, we don't have enough if this is the end of the world. And yet, even today, there's all of these predictions, and we think, we try to add up numbers that we see in Scripture. There's all these um, teachers that try to take different parts of Scripture and add them up to say that this is what it means. And every time we hit a benchmark, everybody, not everybody, thankfully, but a few people tend to go a little overboard with purchasing supplies and panicking. This is the end. The interesting thing is Jesus never said that he knew when. In fact, he said the complete opposite, saying only the Father knows. Forty years later, we know that, that Jesus' prediction came true. The temple was destroyed. So what do we learn from this prediction? I think that we learn that the true foundation, what is real about the cornerstone of our faith, 
The kind of faith that we can stand and not worry that it's going to topple over. Anyone here Lord of the Rings fans? A few people? Those of you who aren't, you generally have an idea of what I'm referring to. Uh, in The Hobbit, uh, Tolkien writes of the character of Bilbo Baggins and the first time he meets with Gollum. And I want to see, for those of you who are fans, uh, how much you remember. There may be a prize. Um, so Bilbo and Gollum meet for the first time. Bilbo is lost, and he needs to find his way out of Gollum's cave. And so Gollum said that he will show him the way out if he can answer a riddle. Uh, and so this is what he says. This things all things devours, birds, beasts, trees, flowers, gnaws iron, bites steel, grinds hard stone to meal, slays king, ruins town, and beats high mountain down. Anyone remember what the answer was? Time. Bilbo uh, was a lot more stumped than that. And then he realizes, wait a minute, time devours all things. And time eventually destroyed the massive temples. So in the meantime, what do we do with our time? For some, that we spend our time focusing the end, the end, the end, the end, and lose on the in-between. My thinking, and what I want to suggest, is that while we're waiting our time for the end, that we live with the expectation of Jesus' return and focus our lifestyle in how we saw Jesus' ministry. There's three really crucial things from Jesus' ministry that I think can be hard, but at the same time, they're the easiest part of his ministry. I'm going to go in reverse order from what I wrote them in. One is clothe the naked. Second is feed the hungry. Practically, when we look at Jesus' ministry, he's constantly responding to the needs of those who are around him. Now, that doesn't mean that this afternoon we need to run out to the parade or downtown and take off our clothes and cover those who are cold. But what it means is we need to be concerned with the people who surround us. What are their needs? If it's not clothes, what is it? If it's not food, what is it? We are surrounded in a world of people who are just desperate. There's an incredible desperation in our world. Looking at the news, aside from certain events lately, we can't watch the news or read the paper and see that everyone's just happy. People are desperate. And out of desperation, we respond in certain ways. And one of the primary things that Jesus showed us, which I think is probably the hardest thing that as Christians we struggle with, and that's love. We talk about it really, really well, even better than Hallmark. And if we're honest, Hallmark talks about it really well. But we, sometimes we fall so short of fulfilling true, authentic love. When my wife and I were married, that was the first thing that um, everyone wanted to remind me of. I'm not sure if that was a sign or not that I wasn't loving at the time. But when you go to a wedding, we constantly hear what love is. But that same verse, even though it's so popular at weddings, also applies to the world around us. And that's difficult because we are constantly faced with difficulty. We're constantly faced with people that push us 
and that we struggle with. I mentioned that in my ministry is, is supporting Thresholds evangelists, and I'm amazed constantly when I, when I talk with our, with, our, with our men and women that they are constantly taking that primary call of Jesus to love to the nth degree. Most of our evangelists are, are loving and caring for those who most of the time we want to ignore. Last fall, we launched um, a street-level project in St. John. And uh, I got a phone call as we were preparing for this launch celebration. And uh, we had put out some flyers to let people know that we were doing this. And, you know, because I think there's, there's something important to let people know what God's doing in their community. And I got a phone call from um, someone who I know is active in their church and said, and they said, Sean, I... I need to tell you something or make sure that you know something. And I said, sure. And I said, you realize that uh, the flyer that you're putting out um, has someone who is notorious to have been involved in prostitution and a former, as well as in the photo, there's a former sex addict. And I said, yeah. And they said, well, is that really who you want to be publicizing that you're working with? And I said, that's exactly who we're working with. These are exactly the people that we are trying to come alongside and help get out of, out of those situations. Now, the conversation ended well, but the woman still didn't feel as though we were marketing the right image. And I thought, this is exactly who God has called us to be caring for. And so that ministry, we've seen this woman who has been known to be in prostitution for many, many years. She's at a weekly Bible study and, and prayer meeting and has stopped. She's come out of that lifestyle. And we give God praise for that. And, and oftentimes the ministries that are the most uncomfortable are the ones where we can see God fully at work. On the, out in Victoria, we've, we've got a, a similar street project. And uh, it's incredible. A few years ago, we, we were kicked out of a building that was owned by a church. And um, the response was that we were attracting the drug addicts uh, and the alcoholics. Um, they didn't dismiss the fact that we were caring for them, but apparently we were attracting them. Uh, even though the, that neighborhood is historically known to be where they hang out. And so we were given um, notice um, that within, by the end of the week we had to be out of the, out of the facilities. Um, what's beautiful is that in that situation, the local media picked it up uh, because the church was proactive and, you know, they thought and sent a press release to the media saying this. And so the headline the next morning was Church of Vic Street Outreach. And I thought, well, I couldn't have written that better myself. <laughs> and the church got a lot of flack for it. And what we got was someone said, I have an RV that we're not using. Here you go. Here are the keys. It's all paid for. And so for a long time, we stayed in the same area. It's just we parked the RV at a church a few blocks away and every night drove it out and parked in front of that church and continued to minister to those people. It's this kind of ministry that we're all called to. And while, you know, with Threshold, we, we appreciate that some of us have, have this vocational call to serve and care for these types of people. As Christians, we are called to respond and to support whether that means that we are actively getting our hands dirty or whether we're prayerfully supporting or financially supporting or resource supporting. We are all called to be doing this type of thing. Because at the end, Jesus, when he does come, when the end does come, it will be the question, did we wait for the end or were we active and the end arrived?
just take a moment to uh, reflect, and um, I'll, as I guess your custom, um, if anyone has any responses or questions, um, we'll, I'll be happy to facilitate that. <laughs> 